A lot of stories revolve around preventing the ultimate end of civilizations, or worlds, or even the universe itself because it's harder to imagine a greater evil than the end of everything we know. The death of the universe in particular could be considered the greatest evil to exist, taking away the present and future of all things across all times and leaving no one with a memory of the past. It is the greatest evil to exist because it is non-existence itself. But this isn't always something occurring due to the will of a maniacal villain or always prevented by the efforts of our heroic heroes. One possible theory for the end of the universe is heat death, an evening of thermodynamic energy across all spaces, creating a state of equilibrium where no free energy can transfer and as such no action will be able to occur again. This happens, in simplified terms, because of entropy. Some energy of motion is always lost to heat, which dissipates and evens, and since energy cannot be created or destroyed, the amount of usable energy left in total goes down. It may sound abstract, but think about a resource like wood. You burn it for fire, and logs undergo a chemical change turning into ash and giving off energy in the forms of heat and light. We can grow more trees, but we can't burn that ash again for more fire. And growing those trees takes energy itself. In this cycle, that expanded energy of the fire isn't going back into it, more is being pulled from elsewhere to sustain it. This can be applied to any resource, even the sun will eventually burn out one day when its fuel is expended. Heat is always leaving usable space, and there is nothing which can be done to stop it. Fortunately for us, it's something like 1.7 times 10 to the 106 years away, which is 17 followed by over 100 zeros years, so we'll be fine. This is the problem which is technically at the center of the 2011 series Monica Magica, since it's the reason behind all of the actions we witness, although it's not revealed until the final episodes. It's not much of a spoiler over 10 years later to mention that Monica Magica has a bit of a dark twist, but be warned just in case. The shoujo magical girl facade of the first few episodes drops to reveal a cycle of tragedy and despair, with almost every character undergoing some psychological horror of some degree due to the monkey's paw style wishes they receive in exchange for fighting evil. However, the series namesake Monica is a bit different since she doesn't become a magical girl until the final episode of the series, despite having apparently unlimited potential. Her mental torture instead comes as Kube, a higher being coming from an alien species known as incubators, explains the reality of the situation to her, recontextualizing not just the death of her closest friends to seem cold and callous, but all of human history to be a falsehood. It's here we find our problem. The heat death of the universe we explained in the introduction, a future the incubators are trying to prevent. To do this, they need a system which produces more energy than it takes, which ideally must also be efficient, and most importantly renewable since the problem is unending. They need a fire that gives off more energy than it takes to create. In simple terms, an impossibility. That is, until they discover the emotional energy of human beings. As Kube states, the amount of emotional energy produced by a single human is greater than the amount used between its birth and growth. Since we create more than we take, if this energy could be collected and converted into physical energy in a way which didn't offset the gains, then the issue would be solved. Humans reproduce at a rate greater than we die, which also means that this energy is renewable, so long as we don't wipe ourselves out and assuming we find a new home once the Earth becomes warmed by the sun's expansion, which should be doable in the billions of years that will take. So it's possible and renewable, but the process is made efficient through their specific target. Magical girls. In exchange for one wish, teenage girls are given the lifelong task of fighting witches, these vicious, evil entities who kill innocent people in ways we interpret as random crimes or natural disasters. It's facilitated by the incubators, who remove their soul from their body and place it in a soul gem, so that they are able to fight efficiently and pass what would kill a body containing a soul. These gems cloud over time and as magic is used, which can only be solved through cleansing it with a grief seed, the remains of the witches they fight. So they can't just make a wish and stop, they must fight to survive. After they cleanse their gems, the remains of the used grief seed is given to Kyube, who collects them. And this is the system of energy. 
The grave seeds contain the heightened emotional energy produced by these girls, who are fuzzy alien claims to be in the stage where the most dramatic levels of emotional energy are produced. When the incubators collect these, they're collecting energy created by our emotions. But if it's the remains of a witch, how is it the girl's energy? Sure, there's clearly some given in the cleansing process, but it's more than that. Witches are magical girls who have fallen to despair, a fate they will all meet sooner rather than later. A grave seed is just a fully clouded soul gem, one which is imbued with the most negative emotional energy possible. By creating the conditions for extreme emotion through these monkey's paw style wishes, the incubators collect the most energy from the least amount of those within a renewable population. The most efficient and inexhaustible solution to an eternal problem. They're preventing the greatest evil possible with a technically as minimized as possible lesser evil placed upon a different species also within the universe. Logically and numerically, it is quite an ideal solution. But does ideal constitute moral? There are more considerations to the contract, including truth, consent, and ultimately will, but we must first understand that such considerations are beyond utility. There's a lot more nuance to what I'm about to explain, but simply put, there are two major schools of ethical thought, utilitarianism and deontology, split over how we determine the correctness of an action. Utilitarianism is concerned with the results, is the happiness within the system maximized. You shouldn't murder, but not because murder is inherently wrong, but because it would not maximize the happiness of the system. Sure, you might be happy from it, but a whole life is now incapable of being so, along with the others who are sad of its passing. While there are variations which depend on rules, basic utilitarianism works on that calculation. Deontology is instead concerned with will. Was the intent of an action good and in line with ethical rules? You shouldn't murder because taking a life doesn't respect the value inherent to human lives. Its considerations lie within making rules of best practice. Now, each theory has downsides. I mean, how do you measure the happiness of an entire system, and how do you incentivize goodwill as the standard when it's easily abused? This is why ethics was my first held interest within philosophy. It's a fascinating act of trying to box the world in through goodwill and completely being unable to, showing how vast and amazing the world is. But back to the series, if we examine the action simply through utility, it is more easily seen as correct, this position the incubators take. As said, the action is the most efficient, most evil minimized solution to a difficult problem. From the sacrifices of a few girls, the entire universe gets to live on. The number of people made unhappy is nearly 0%, concerned to the number of life forms who get to keep being happy. And even if we consider that the deal must be even for all parties involved, we can still side with Cube. They describe it as a mutually beneficial relationship because humanity overall receives benefits from this deal. One telling exchange is this. If your kind had never come to Earth, then none of this. You humans would most likely still be living naked, in caves. The world we know today, with its great comforts and conveniences, is in this world a result of the incubator's intervention. They let us tap into our own power to become creatures capable of escaping nature to our own exceptional comfort. Kind of, we'll get back to that later. But even if the heat death of the universe doesn't directly benefit the average person, these results which come from the deal certainly do. And the maintenance of life elsewhere is shown as a benefit to us as well when Cube also states, There will come a day when you humans figure out how to leave this planet. You wouldn't want to find the universe empty and desolate, would you? Not only is there a direct payoff for the human race, but our children and their children and their children and so on and so on and so on will experience a world millions of miles ahead of our own because they'll be greeted by a life far away and that much more advanced. Even if we narrow things further and say those who are making the sacrifice must be compensated equally, it's hard to find a utilitarian fault in the aliens' arguments. However unintuitive it seems, there is a direct benefit to the girls making these wishes. These wishes go beyond the realm of possibility, from crowds to listen to a preacher who was disgraced and hated, time travel to be reunited with a love over and over again, and healing an injury incurable with modern science. 
The last case is the most explored in the wish made by Sai Kamiki for her secret love, Kiyosuke. A violinist with a wrist injury to the point of no repair, he suffers with the inability to do the one thing which gave his life purpose. Witnessing this pain, Saika wishes for him to be healed, accepting a destiny of fighting witches for this. We can argue that even though she gives up her life to do this, it is technically even, if not, a beneficial trade. Kyosuke had an injury which would never be fully healed. As he states, He said that current medicine can't help anymore. My hand is never gonna move right again. And we witnessed him struggling quite heavily with physical therapy. Even with a full lifetime of effort, he would never achieve this goal. So a wish which does so can be reasoned as greater than a life because it is creating something that is impossible within the span of one, something beyond the collected efforts of a whole human experience. Kyoko's wish for her father to be listened to drawing a lifetime's worth of attention, Homura's time traveling allowing her to live with Monica many lives over, Mommy's to live past an accident which should have claimed her life. All of these things can be argued as worth a life because they produce more than one ever could. What we're left with from considering only utility is a nearly impossible problem solved with the most practical solution and embedded with beneficing factors for all the costs. To take issue with this arrangement, as Monica and the others do, we must consider some value of a single life which is greater than utility. But even then, our preconceptions may cloud a true consideration. When we start to consider Will, the waters grow murky. Yes, the girls did technically consent to a deal, a fact the incubators hold over them when they state, But we always ask for and make sure to receive your consent before making the contract. However, the deal they were made aware of was that the girls receive a wish, and in exchange for that they must fight witches for the rest of their life. They are never informed of the collection of their energy, that their soul is separated from their body, or the fact that they are destined to become witches themselves. In typical fashion, it's not argued to truly be a lie because no one asked for the full terms. However, omission is best framed itself as a lie because the incubators were clearly aware of the consequences and actions. We list the side effects of medications, even ones which don't directly concern the condition it's treating, because consent can only be given with proper knowledge. You've probably been pissed off before at a job listing that failed to describe a few key duties, even if they got most of them. They're duties that you didn't consent to but now have to do. Imagine that, but it's a guarantee for the rest of your life and quickly arriving death. One of the tests for deontology as a standard of morality is universality. Would this action be both satisfying and consistent if it was applied universally? That is to say, can we reasonably argue active omission would be good in all situations? Sure, it sounds personally good when we alone do it, we gain an advantage from it, like selling a car without listing every issue. But if everyone was doing it, we would lose any advantage from doing so, in addition to the fact that it would become meaningless if everyone was. We'd all be getting broken cars for broken cars. Everyone would assume information is being left out since we know everyone is committing a mission, and so there would be no point to even doing it since it's already assumed. Since it's not an appealing on a large scale, and also not consistent on a large scale, it cannot be correct. But that feels so much too simple, doesn't it? To take such a grand premise and solve it with the most basic example from a major ethical branch? Well, that's because it is. These arguments are based on a human perspective, but we are considering a problem being solved by those witnessing humanity from beyond it. They learned to treat us from how we behaved, and so we must ask, is it wrong for us to be misled by an observational being if we mislead ourselves? Part of the reason why Sayaka's wish, and many others, lead to despair is because she didn't understand her own will. She questions herself as such. If I used my wish to heal Kyosuke, how would he feel about it? Would he just say thanks? Or am I hoping for something more to happen? This comes after a warning from her magical girl mentor, Mamori Tomoe, who warns that anyone making a wish for someone else has to seriously consider why they're doing it. Is it for that person's sake, or because they want something in return from them? 
Sayaka at first finds herself happy with her wish, going as far to say it's the best day of her life and she'll never regret it, but as her friend Hitomi begins to date Kyosuke rather than her, she comes face to face with the harsh reality from her pain that she wished for his health, at least in part, so that he would have the capacity to love her, no longer made cruel by his injuries. She tries to convince herself of good intent, despite harboring some selfishness. We have to then consider that this is what the incubators are judging us based off of, and in a way, our actions mimic theirs. By wishing for someone else with a selfish desire, we are providing them with a great benefit in exchange for what we desire from them without their consent to that secret desire. It's analogous to the way they grant us a wish in exchange for our energy. They witness this as something we do and determine it must not be incorrect. Further, since it is an act of misleading oneself, can we say that they are wrong to mislead us as well within the frame of reference? Can something someone does to themselves be morally wrong? However, this statement we played from them earlier about consent goes even further. The full quote is, Make sure to receive your consent before making the contract. That alone should show you that we don't mean you any ill will. I think we have to put aside the assumptions of our perspective and examine this. Is it the truth as far as their understanding of our ethics can be concerned? We as humans are unique individuals with bodies that determine our life, death, and a lot of who we are. From this we feel emotions, conflict and joy alike with the distinct beings around us. We have to be different from other people and we have to grow and change and feel pain to feel emotions. All of these things are interconnected into our physicality and our individuality. So of course these things and the respect of them, of our bodies and individuality are important. We only exist as we could ever know because of these things. But these same assumptions aren't true of Cubase kind. They don't appear to have individual personalities, but rather operate on similar to one being across multiple spaces. When killed by Homura, another Kyubei just steps out from elsewhere to carry on the conversation without missing a beat, which it explains as having spare bodies. But that explanation could easily refer to one being which has had its consciousness spread across multiple bodies not each specific being actually having spare ones. In fact, that's how such a being would explain it since they wouldn't understand individuality to begin with, even if they express themselves as a species to fit with how we classify things. To go with that, there is no way for them to feel emotions like this because as they evolve, there would be no personality which developed as distinct from others, and so nothing to emote over. There would be no sense of fear or joy driving them forward because there is no body to maintain. Emotions would be alien to these aliens. This also means they wouldn't place any sort of value on the physical form they inhabit. They are truly and genuinely a consciousness detached from a body. Those forms are simply one of many shells to carry their being. With these clear distinctions, can we hold them to our same system of ethics? Since they are not individuals, there is no way for them to have an understanding of deception. Since they have no concept of a single body, there is no way for them to understand the importance of ours as a defining trait. Since they have no emotions, there is no way for them to understand illogical reactions to what's seen as logical problems. In the same way we are shaped by our surroundings, their surroundings develop them to be without any of these things. They don't state what we perceive as additional costs because to them they are not even factors. Well, one of them is actually perceived as a benefit to them, the separation of body and soul. As far as they see, there are only upsides to this, and it's kind of true. The only downside is that if one goes too far from their soul gem, their body ceases to function. But as long as one is careful to keep their soul gem close, they're much stronger than they are with their soul inside of their body itself. And sure, a destruction of the gem will kill you, but so will an equivalent blow to your body anyway. The only thing attaching us to ours is the human value we place on it, which they lack an understanding of. Asking them to go by our system of ethics is like asking someone who only speaks Spanish to understand this video right at this moment. They simply lack the building blocks to do so, whatever their intent is. We see with Monica that the same is true of us and their system of morality. When they attempt to explain the nature of our relationship as they see fit, 
It sends Monica into a panic where she explains that she can't understand what they're saying at all. And it's definitely fair for her to say that. Do any of us truly understand the perspective of a universal being? Can we comprehend what it takes to be in all places at once? To live long enough to think that the end of the universe could be an issue? Can we say for certain that we would still have emotions with that long of a perspective? Or would the issues we feel emotions over become so minuscule we would forget them? And there's no way we can understand concepts which rely on knowledge such a being would possess. Hell, we struggle even with our own species when you look at something like an advanced physics problem or, like we already said, a language barrier. Think about it all like this. This is the longest recorded human lifespan ever. This is the estimated amount of time until heat death. How could anyone understand that? Monica simply rejects the perspective because it's beyond what she can be expected to understand as a human being. The point is, the issue might not be deception, but not even knowing what deception is to begin with. Neither side could communicate to the other the necessary elements for how they value the fairness or unfairness of the trade. With that in mind, how can we hold one to the ethics of the other? The best option we may have is to go off of intent alone and their intent was to help the entire universe, and in many ways, humanity within that. So it's right, right? But is this good faith they espouse really true? What if we consider some element of attempted understanding as just as important? I say this because we can see that Cuba does at least understand that what it's doing goes against our usual ethical systems, even if it doesn't comprehend the elements of those systems. They state, Whenever I tell you humans the simple facts, you always react the same way. And other similar lines which express they've made themselves actively aware of how humans react to the truth of their deal. With this in mind, it's just as true that they could communicate what they have observed to us to be negative aspects, even if they don't feel it's something worth considering. Extra information will always be better than too little information, even if each has downsides. What this means is that they witness our problem of discussion today, that there are two incongruent ethical systems, and then they continue on as if theirs is correct nonetheless. I think this is where we can find a basis to truly consider them immoral, because it constitutes an active disregard for the collective will of human beings laid out in these ethical systems. They also seem to utilize the concept of deception they learned from us outside of the stipulated contract as well. When Saika becomes a witch, her rival turned friend Kyoko decides to believe that, despite never happening before, there may be some way to reclaim Saika's soul as they kill the witch. While it's Kyoko deceiving herself as she did with her wish, this time she confers with Kyube, asking if it's something which is possible. They state that, although it hasn't ever happened before, they can't say for certain that it won't be achievable in some way. Yet later, when Homer asks if there was any chance for success, they state, of course not. She should have known that was impossible. Which means they took the concept of a mission into an outright lie by failing to answer the question which was properly asked. This isn't letting someone deceive themselves. This is leading them to do so. With this, we consider the statement of no ill will is at least partially false, and now we can consider the implications of that being false. But here, we reach a fairly large impasse. We can't simply compromise our ethical systems because of that inherent mismatch. There aren't even base factors to draw a line between. There's nothing which matches up. Once again, the best example is trying to communicate between languages. A bit of charades can force some level of understanding and even teach a few words, but there's no way to comprehend the finer details. Without a medium for understanding, two individuals will never mesh. So one of the considerations we have to make is which ethical system we stand by or how we weigh the considerations of each. There are a few schools of thought here. We can distinguish certain characteristics as indicative of true life and of such value. We can apply a blanket valuation to all life, or we can find some way to measure the importance of those lives as objectively as possible. The first option is an exceptionally slippery slope that we explored in a different video on the series from the New World, and I'd recommend that one if you want a super interesting look at how important the definition we apply to human really is. So we won't go with the first option, and if we choose the middle, we don't actually find a solution to the problem, we 
just reach the same state of an extremely unlikely compromise between incongruent systems. To really move forward, we have to consider the unsavory proposition of valuing different forms of life based on impact. Doing this objectively is very difficult, but since the problem is the physical makeup of the universe, which every living being will impact and be impacted by to some degree, that it is one of the few common mediums we could use. As such, the potential impact we have on the universe, along with how we do so, could be the most ideal valuation. The incubators would have quite the large weight here, as beings which are actively attempting to keep energy flowing in the universe, and also have the power to do so. Meanwhile, we as humans, without their input, have exceptionally close to no impact on the universe whatsoever. Technically, we could have a potential future impact, but that could be said of any species given enough time. If the incubator's words are true, then without them, we would never even have come close. We wouldn't even have an impact on our own world. The energy we produce is nothing without their work to utilize it either, so that's a consideration in favor of them, not in favor of us. With this in mind, we don't have a leg to stand on in this argument. Are we ones who should have a say in the ethics of a concern of universal size when we can't even comprehend such a thing to begin with, let alone impact it? The same is true if we decide on something else like lifespan instead, siding with those who have the potential to experience more happiness and as such the most potential for greater good. Once again, we become infinitesimally small and we have to abide by the will of others. We also have to wonder if they have any duty to adhere to our moral standards at all, when with their perspective it is a fact that their intervention can improve our lives, which is in theory a generous intent. This is similar to a question we asked in a video on Gurren Lagann and respecting tradition. Do we have an obligation to allow others to hurt themselves if they believe it is the right thing to do? Or is it correct to step in against their will for a mostly objective betterment? This is even brought up somewhat in the anime when Madoka's mom says, Sometimes doing the wrong thing for someone is exactly the right thing to do. When Madoka asks her for help and how to assist Sayaka. And that serves as a good example itself. I'm genuinely sorry to plug a third video in this one alone, but we covered Sayaka super in-depth in a detailed profile that's going to give more information than I could right here. In that, we discovered that the core of her downfall was a purposefully skewed sense of justice meant to exclude everyone else so that she could find some sense of self-worth in comparison. It's how she goes from this, It's okay if you don't want to be a magical girl too. Maybe you just weren't meant for it. Early on, to this, you won't even give up your humanity out of pity for a friend. Near the end of the series. She's doing what she has reasoned as just. However, from the outside, we can clearly see this personal system of right and wrong is hurting her. It's essentially believing that self-sacrifice to the point of death is the only moral option. What if this is what the incubators see when they look at us? A species with a lot of potential often held back by its own preconceptions made for the purpose of feeling valuable. There's an argument to be made that our standards are nothing more than purposeful restrictions in order to feel more valuable than the nature which will eventually reclaim us one day anyway. It could be, as we said earlier, akin to deceiving ourselves overall. As such, witnessing both of these facts, it may only seem right for a higher being to step in and even trick us into a more advanced state. It helps us even though it is without our consent. We've gone against our own consent in a way through self-deception and given them the perspective that such a thing might be moral. Plus, they didn't direct our advancement but gave us the ability to do it ourselves. The world these humans know is still of their choosing and will, just with a head start from above. As Kube says, it does to some degree respect our own intent. But there is something which sullies this. It isn't something that's been done out of the goodness of their hearts, but for some gain. The advancement of the human race makes the system better. With less focus on survival, we have more time to brood in our emotions and as such have heightened emotions for more energy, and we reproduce more effectively and more efficiently, making the system more efficient and more renewable. This would recontextualize everything because it shifts the focus to what's truly being exchanged. It isn't an advancement for goodwill, it's energy for power with selective byproducts. What it would make it wrong by our usual standards, once again all it does is bring us back to the problem which began this section. So what? 
The harsh truth is that in this incongruent mismatch, there will always be some level of might is right. One can object to anything a higher power does on an ethical basis, but working under their own sense of right and wrong, the more powerful being will always exert their will because it is, from their perspective, the correct thing to do, and so they even have an obligation to use that power for good under certain ethical theories. Perspective, perspective, perspective. A pesky little thing on the channel recently. It's the way we can better our lives, the way we can be alone together, and the way we can be morally conquered by aliens. It's quite a thing, isn't it? Throughout this video, we've been considering ourselves at the disadvantage in every ethical situation we witnessed for one reason or another. It feels like a completely raw deal to look at a situation both logically and ethically and come back to the conclusion that something which feels so wrong to us is so hard to actually push back against in any way. And some of the later justifications have felt outright disgusting, amounting to little more than assumed superiority of one life form over another. Monica Magica is of course making a point here, but we must once again engage in perspective and shift it. We have to view ourselves as the incubators and the rest of our world's inhabitants as the humans. Kube makes this quite direct when he somewhat scolds Monica, saying, Do you feel any guilt or remorse for the livestock you consume? They state our own mutually beneficial relationship with them as a justification for why we don't feel such a thing. We provide them a comfortable, long life before they become our food, potentially even longer on average than in the wild due to a lack of predation. The moral justification for Cube's actions against us that we find so unfair is a copy of our own actions to the species we lord over. Much like deception, they witnessed it, and because it was witnessed as prevalent and justified, there was no basis to determine it would be wrong to mimic. If we didn't have this relationship with livestock, would the incubators have ever chosen to prey on humanity? Are we teaching anything watching us that such a thing is right? That if they copy what we have justified, they're right in conquering us. And why is it that we have this arrangement? Much like Cube, we don't provide a long, comfortable life to cattle out of the goodness of our hearts, but because a long, comfortable life brings the most benefits back to us. They can grow larger, produce more offspring, and any other byproduct such as eggs or milk will keep going on for longer. The mutual benefit may be truly good for both sides, but it is still an enforcement of what's best for us and just so happens to simply be good for them. And only sometimes, a long and happy life isn't in store for every farm animal. Some are locked in cages for their entire lives, standing on the corpses of their brothers and sisters, knowing nothing more of the world than this, a fucked up real world example of the allegory of the cave. The most cruel among us may even justify it with that. By never letting them know a wider world exists is a constant cage cruelty. There's no lie when Cube says that they treat humans much better than we treat livestock. While it may not be ideal to us, they respect our will as much as possible while still robbing us, providing individual wishes for these impacted most, sparing nearly the full majority of us and allowing us to advance into a full world as we see fit. They expand the world we know, but we shrink the world of our livestock, even to the point of cruelty. Incubators, even under deception, try to gather some form of consent. Do we do that at all? Of course, this line of questioning starts to sound insane. How do you ask a cow about freedom when both it cannot communicate with us and also has no concept of such things? But isn't this logic simply superiority at play? How do we know that deep down, animals don't also have some concept of freedom or of right and wrong? Aren't we just animals like them which evolved and spurred forth such things? Would we not look back at our much distant ancestors and say the same things about them? If we let the rest of our world grow free or even further help them, with enough time, couldn't they eventually become more attuned to our senses and level of thought? But we don't do that. We limit the world to make it ours, coating it in concrete and asphalt, and we will destroy it long before any other species could reach the level we were allowed. In the same breath, also wouldn't we say that the incubators, as the more powerful being, have the responsibility to use that power in order to establish some means of communication with us to find some way to understand that which is ours, since it will always be easier for them to move down than for us to move up? 
Wouldn't we feel slighted if aliens destroyed us because we didn't know what they were saying? So how can we reason that communication is the fault of the less advanced being when only we hold the power to do so efficiently and actively hold them back from it? Superiority is our justification deep down and it goes further. Maybe we turn to the total impact like we did for the incubators to justify ourselves or for others, if we have done so much more to and for this world than cattle ever could. But not only can that be used against us, but we are actively preventing the impact of these creatures by beholding their evolution to our will, to what we can gain from them. What they become is what we decide. Being human today, living in this world, is an act of superiority. Don't get me wrong, I don't blame anyone for it. It's the only option presented to us. When everything is property, one can't simply run off into the woods and exit the systems of society, no matter how much we like to think that's sometimes possible. Someone else will always hold the means for what they need to do so. And therein lies the evolution of this issue. It's not just that all of these arguments we make could also be used against us by a higher power, but that we use them against ourselves just the same every day. We say that one race is somehow superior to another because of the impact they've produced when one held the other back for as long as they'd known each other. We use the measurements of impact to justify ignoring or even actively killing homeless individuals because they have no means to produce, which is the only thing we use to value people in this world. More advanced nations meddle in the affairs of smaller ones for their own gain, reasoning that it is the just thing to do from our perspective so we must do it, it is responsibility, not war. Our ethics don't communicate so we force ours in and eventually it'll become the law and that's fine enough. And if the gap is large enough, we reason even further that we do this because those lower civilizations simply can't comprehend what proper ethics are. They don't even know about freedom until we show them the definition of it on the bottom of a boot. Even with what we call our advanced societies, are we actually allowed comfort because it's right? Or because just enough comfort and just enough care keeps us alive and profitable for longer? Are the benefits just byproducts of collecting from us? As the retirement age is upped or considered to be in multiple places, we see that we are not allowed rest because of some well-deserved break, but because that's the age where we stop being useful to them after years of abuse. Like the magical girls, we are expended of our energy and then tossed aside. But it's not from aliens above. It's from people who just like you and just like me were born of human beings, yet now crush them under their boot and ask for a thank you just for the chance to have it happen. And the lie of a mission, we cannot forget that in spades. Work and you'll be rewarded with the ideal, picturesque little life, especially if you do it hard enough. But does that include an explanation of the brain fog from being on the clock for what's well over eight hours and being unable to appreciate anything? Does that include the costs you have to pay to get that job to begin with? A clothes, car, internet, a home address, a phone number, everything that goes along with maintaining those things? Does it include the body that's supposed to be living that perfect little life deteriorating? If it sounds like I'm angry, it's because I am. I'm just over halfway through my 20s, so why can't I climb stairs normally some days because my fucking knees feel like they're degrading? I can't relax because all the jobs for the degree I was told would be promising are both awful, full of hateful people, and so far away that when you consider commuting and preparation, I have just under five and a half hours of time to myself each day without even accounting for chores, meals, and other responsibilities yet, which are themselves just an act of maintenance to be able to hold a job and keep producing for someone else's gain. You are not paid money for food and shelters so that you can live. You are paid money for food and shelter so that you can keep producing. If you're mad at Cube in this story's context, but not mad at and terrified for our own world, then you should probably consider why. Does the reason come down to something like, that's just how it is? Do you argue for any of the flawed arguments we presented here that could be used to reason for the death of our own species, but think it's okay because for right now, your group of human is the advanced one? Let me tell you, when a system is built on always crushing someone, eventually it works its way up. No one is safe. We are incubators not even trying to solve the eventual guaranteed death. And that's that. I won't end this on some hopeful note because hope betrays the anger that was required for action. This should leave you sad and angry, and those negative emotions we feel and are justified in feeling should drive us forward. So get angry. Get mad. Break the contract if it's not fair. 
it would be much too ironic to end this video on a note about making money, so I'll leave my patrons' names off of this one and work out some kind of solution with them in exchange over there privately. But thank you for your time as always. I hope that I'll see you again soon.